Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the Dieckmann condensation, which is essentially the same thing as the Claisen condensation, but this is an intramolecular version, which is going to give you a cyclic product at the end. So unlike the Claisen condensation, where we start with two equivalents of esters, whether those are the same molecule or different, in the Dieckmann condensation both ester groups or the part of the same molecule. So as a result, you're going to end up with a cyclic compound and you are going to still form a 1,3-dicarbonyl, although your carbonyls are not going to be sitting on a straight chain, it's going to be a part of the cyclic moiety. So let's go ahead and take a look at the mechanism of this reaction. Just like what you would expect in the case of the Claisen condensation, we are going to start by treating our molecule with the base, sodium ethoxide in this case, which going to come in and deprotonate one of the alpha positions that we have in this molecule. Which position exactly we're going to grab in this case doesn't matter because for this particular example I chose a completely symmetrical molecule, so we can do it either on the left or on the right side like what I'm doing here. Now, as a result of this proton transfer, we are going to get an enolate and unlike Lysen where we had to bring the second equivalent of our carbonyl into the reaction, Action. Here we have both our nucleophile, which is my enolate, and my electrophile, which is my carbonyl, being the part of the same molecule, so they can react with each other right away. And when they do so, my electron cascade will look like this, making a new carbon-carbon bond between the alpha carbon of my enolate and the carbon of my carbonyl. So I'm going to end up with a 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six membered rings. So I'm making a new bond between carbons number one and carbon number six. And since drawing the cyclic products is always a little bit of a challenge, let me show you the best way how to approach a problem like that or a step like that. First, as I did before, I number my carbons from the nucleophile to electrophile or from electrophile to nucleophile. Doesn't matter, those are just our anchors. And since I know that I have a six membered ring as my product, I'm going to start by drawing a six-membered ring. Then I'm going to number my atoms. You can do it either clockwise or counterclockwise, that doesn't matter. But what does matter is that now these numbers will allow me to trace where my groups and different uh, atoms are in the final product, so that will make it much easier for me to visualize how this product is going to look like. So I know that I've made a new bond between carbons 1 and 6, so I'm actually going to highlight that bond like that. Then on carbon number one, I have an oxygen which is now going to be bearing a negative charge, so I'm going to draw that guy. On top of that, I have this ethoxy group over here, which is also sitting on carbon number one. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that one as well. Then I don't have anything on carbons two, three, four, or five, but the carbon number six has the rest of my molecule, this part of the ester. So I'm going to draw that part as well. So now we can clearly see where our new bond is, where I just made that new bond, and the rest of the molecule is sitting where it needs to sit. Of course, if you had any substituents on carbons two, three, four, or five, uh, you would add those substituents at the appropriate places as well. Now, the intermediate that I got here, that is our tetrahedral intermediate, just like we saw in the case of the Claisen condensation, so the next step in our mechanism is going to be the living group dissociation where my negatively charged oxygen going to kick the ethoxide out, making the following dicarbonyl, but we know that that is not the end of our mechanism because we still have this hydrogen in between our carbonyls and we have also just formed the ethoxide, which going to immediately deprotonate that position because the PKA of that position is relatively low, and we are going to get the corresponding enolate. Now, from this point on, the only thing that is left for us is to do our acidic workup. So I'm going to bring my water here, and I will show how water 
protonates our enolates, giving us our final product looking like this. And yes, just like in the Kleisen condensation, we end up drawing the same molecule twice in the course of this mechanism, but the very first time when we are seeing this product, we cannot isolate that part because that molecule gets immediately deprotonated by the ethoxy that we have floating around, so we have to reprotonate that molecule to get it back. So keep that in mind if you are drawing this mechanism for the exam purposes and do not stop at this point. The acidic workup that we have in Kleisen and Dickman condensation is there for a reason. Now, what if we look at the example that is just a little bit more difficult than my previous example? The only thing that I've done here, I have added this extra ethyl group in the alpha position. But because of that, the molecule is no longer symmetrical. So we have this orange alpha position on the right side and we have this green alpha position on the left side, which means that we can potentially get two different products. In the first case, where my alpha position is going to be enolized and we are reacting with the uh, carbonyl on the left side, we are going to get a product that looks like this. And in the other case, where my green alpha position gets enolized, well, in that case, if we react with the right carbonyl, we are going to get the following final product. And while I'm just using a quick shortcut here to draw my final product, make sure you can draw the mechanism for both of those reactions and you know how I actually got to that product. Now, coming back to my products here, one of them is going to be actually formed, while the other one is going to be an extremely minor product. Can you guess which one it is? I'll give you a hint. Remember how I always emphasize this alpha proton and the fact that the deprotonation and enolization of that position is the driving force for the reaction? Well, that is your clue. Unless we can analyze that position, the reaction can just as easily go backwards, open up and give you the starting material. However, if you snatch that proton, then there is no going back. The presence of this analyzable position is going to be a driving force, which means that the product that I drew on the top that product is not going to be formed in any appreciable amount, and our major product in this reaction is going to be the bottom molecule where I do have the inalizable position. Or, as a rule of thumb, you can remember that in the Kleisen or Dickman condensation, you cannot form a quaternary carbon between your carbonyls. That molecule will decompose and it will open up. So you always must have the inalizable position in between the carbonyls. That hydrogen is an absolute must for the reaction. Now, while there is no really a mixed Dickman condensation or cross Dickman condensation, we can have a kind of mixed reaction or Dickman style reaction where one side of the molecule like what I have over here, is a ketone, and the other side is our ester. So if we take this molecule and we try to treat it with the base, like in the previous case, we are going to have some options. However, the options here are going to be of a different type. Let me explain what I mean. Let's take our molecule and I'm going to make a copy of that molecule right over here. Now, I have not two, but three inalizable alpha positions. So let's call them the green alpha position, the blue alpha position, and let's say the orange alpha position like that. If before both of our alpha positions had roughly the same pKa values, the same acidity, now the acidity of those alpha positions is actually not the same. The pKa values for both my green and blue alpha positions, just a regular ketone, they're about 9 or so, while the pKa of the alpha position of my ester side of the molecule is about 22-24, which means that we have at least 1000 times difference in our acidity. Which means that if I try to deprotonate that molecule and convert it into the corresponding enolate, I'm going to go with my more acidic position and not the one with a higher pKa value. So essentially, in this compound, I can ignore my orange 
change alpha position because that one is not acidic enough in comparison to my other alpha position. But we still have two different possible enolates. And my green enolate is going to look like this, while my blue enolate is going to have the following structure. And in order to figure out the major product in this case, we are going to look at the size of the cycle that we are going to be producing for both of those enolates. In the case of my green enolate, I'm going to be reacting the alpha position on the left side of the molecule with my carbonyl, giving me a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six-membered ring, while in the case of the blue enolate, I'm going to be reacting the alpha position in the middle of the molecule with my carbonyl, giving me a one, two, three, four-membered ring. So when it comes to the ring sizes in the Dickman condensation, the five, six, and seven-membered rings are okay. However, three or four-membered rings are a big no for us. We're not going to be able to make those due to the strain in those rings and the inherent instability of those molecules. Which means that my blue enolate is a dead end and I'm no longer going to be even looking at that guy, while my green enolate is the one that I'm going to continue my reaction with. So here, if I wanted to draw my curved arrows, like before, I would do it from my nucleophile to my electrophile like so, giving me a six-membered ring. Now, on carbon number one, I have my negatively charged oxygen. I also have this ethoxy group. And then carbon number five is going to have the carbonyl now. And from this point, as per usual, we are going to kick our living group out giving us 1,3-cyclohexadione over here, and, of course, the ethoxide that has just left our molecule. So, we are going to deprotonate the position between our carbonyls, make the corresponding enolate, then reprotonate our enolate, and go back to 1,3-cyclohexadione as our final product. And I understand that this whole story of deprotonating our molecule and then immediately reprotonating it back feels like there and back again over and over again, so even Bilbo Baggins would get jealous, but that's the way it works, so that's the way we gotta write this mechanism. And the take-home message here is that this reaction, the Dickman condensation, is exactly like the Kleisen condensation, with the only difference is that both reacting parts are the parts of the same molecule, which means that we are going to end up with the ring as our final product. That's it. So, what do you think about the Dickman condensation? Do you like this reaction? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. If you learned something new today, hit that like button and remember to subscribe so you don't miss any future updates. Check out this video next, and I will see you next time.